one lifetime of my mother's generation that we changed from women not being allowed to vote to the incredible changes that have happened. And of course, nothing is perfect, but we have seen huge change, and I've watched it in so many areas of my life. I started out in the 70s, starting a, a little group called Women Associates, and we were bringing the message of equality to the CBC, to all sorts of areas. I then became the first um, director of the Office of Equal Opportunity for Women for the City of Ottawa. We brought in the first women firefighters and the first people on the outside, snow removal and all of that, and we just ran up against absolute uh, aggression. In fact, they had, <coughs> like most city halls in that day, they would hire people, in Ottawa it was French and English, so the, they would get somebody, senior would get to hire his nephew, and then somebody on the other side would get to hire his brother or whatever. And it was all just, there was no, absolutely no uh, equality, no concept of this. And I just want you to know how, how recent, how actually recent it is that we have this notion of, of, of even attempting that kind of equality. I then got the opportunity to work for Trudeau Senior as a senior advisor on women's issues. Um, I wasn't a liberal, but it was an opportunity to bring the message at a national level. And he said, if he was staying it, this was 1982, 83, he's, he left in 84, but he said, if I was staying, and he wasn't sure at the time, he said, I'm going to build the whole next campaign on a platform of equality for women. And I always remember being in a, at a conference and somebody introduced me as his, um, his advisor on women's affairs and I said, no, he looks after his own affairs and I look at, I, I'm his advisor on women's issues. And then I looked up and, of course, there's a Globe and Mail reporter. Uh, not good. Uh, so it was through these years that, that um, the changes started to happen. This is when uh, Ronald Reagan got into the White House and, and uh, Margaret Thatcher became the Prime Minister of Great Britain and this wave of what we're still living with uh, swept over the, the industrialized countries. This notion of uh, economic globalization, privatization, deregulation, just a massive change. It started a little bit in Trudeau Senior's years with something called the McDonald Commission. But then in 1984, Brian Mulroney became Prime Minister. And the very first thing he did is he went down to the United States, he went to New York City and he spoke to a blue chip group of business leaders and he said, Canada has changed, we're open for business, the rules are gone, come up and take our energy, uh, and we are setting up a free trade agreement, we can totally change, the rules are off, and foreign investment rules are going to be basically gone. I mean, his first speech, telling who he was going to be and what he was going to promote was not to a uh, Canadian audience, was to a blue chip international business audience in New York City, so this was the beginning of a very profound change that went all over the world, as you know. And this was basically what happened was that corporations outgrew uh, their domestic base. So before that, you know, with some changes but, or some exceptions, most companies belonged in a particular country. But with technology and with all the advances in every other way, they were able to start to go global to become trans, uh, multinational or more specifically transnational. To my mind, multinational is you're still thinking in a number of countries, but transnational is that you're basically, you don't belong to any country. <clears throat> you don't belong to any set of rules. You don't belong, there's no international set of rules that have caught up with you. You are a state, in, in other words, you're almost like a state and you have equal power. And that's when they first started talking about the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement because that's what they started to need. What companies, <clears throat> what corporations wanted was basically four things. And it's very important for us to know that this modern group of free trade agreements is not about taking down tariffs and goods, which is what it used to be through the 60s and 70s and early 80s. Basically what they wanted is four things. They wanted the right to move their production offshore without being censored. They wanted access to public services, which they're getting bit by bit, and you don't probably don't even know, but there's a new trade agreement coming down the pike called the Trade and Services Agreement. It's like 80% done. This is one the United States has not pulled out of. I don't even know if Trump has noticed it, but it's a really dangerous one that we need to have our sights on because it's being promoted by the big health and water and education uh, transnationals. They also wanted to do, they also wanted to limit what governments were allowed to do. These are called non-tariff barriers. And non-tariff barriers are the rules and regulations that protect workers, 
that protect um, wages, that protect the environment, health and safety, limit what chemicals can go into to our, on our lands and so on. Uh, the notion of the precautionary principle had to go and it was one of the first things to go in this new wave of economic globalization. Corporations said, we'll self-govern. The United Nations set up a whole process where they invited some of the worst polluters in the world and the worst human rights uh, uh, abusers in the world, like Monsanto and Shell and so on, brought them together and set up a voluntary code of conduct. And basically, government said, fine, if you guys are going to look after these rules, we'll just give them over to you. And still, so started this massive deregulation. <clears throat> they also wanted to, this is very important, they wanted to limit the ability of governments to say no to resource exports. So they wanted to be able to move the exports from anywhere they wanted. Or, sorry, export the resources like fish and trees and minerals and so on to um, the, the, the low wage places that they were now operating in. And they wanted all of this without any, any kind of censor. So this started with the Canada US Free Trade Agreement. This was back in 1983, well, 84, 85, when Maloney and Ronald Reagan were in power. And Reagan came to Canada and they sang when Irish eyes are smiling and we put up a balloon saying we don't want you here. And we have, that's the, you know, the beginning of this confrontation that is going on as we speak in Ottawa today. They're just or they wound up last night, this new set of, of NAFTA negotiations. And uh, that morphed into the North American Free Trade Agreement. And the North American Free Trade Agreement was the first one in the world where where a corporation didn't have to go, to, or an industry sector didn't have to go to its own government to get it to lay a challenge with another government if they weren't happy with what was happening. They could do it themselves. It's called ISDS, Investor State uh, Dispute Sen Settlement. In, in uh, NAFTA, it's called Chapter 11, and we warned at the time, this is a very, very dangerous thing for, for us to be doing collectively. It's going to give corporations the ability to act like their governments, they set up a three-person panel where uh, basically uh, trade lawyers who believe in this stuff get to make a decision, a uh, very serious decision about um, all sorts of regulations that get challenged. That then morphed into over 3,500 bilateral trade agreements in the world or investment agreements where corporations can sue uh, governments. And most of these corporations are big companies coming from rich countries going after poor com companies. Uh, poor countries, uh, and some of the, the decisions that have been made through the World Bank are absolutely atrocious. NAFTA Canada has been on the losing end. Um, <clears throat> there have been 39 challenges under Chapter 11. The United States has not lost one. Canada and Mexico have both lost. We've paid about $215 million in compensation to American corporations, but we're currently facing uh, $6.8 uh, 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 billion. Sorry, $2.8 billion worth of uh, challenges from American companies, and mostly, by the way, these are for environmental standards. So, for instance, Quebec brought in a moratorium against uh, allowing um, uh, uh, fracking operations under the St. Lawrence and so on. They're being sued, interestingly, by a Canadian energy company, Lone Pine, uh, which they shouldn't be allowed to do under the, the agreement. It should be a foreign company, but they're using their American subsidiary to come back. So we fought, and we set up this little group called the Council of Canadians, and we fought Mulroney, and we fought, um, and we fought uh, Reagan, and we fought this agreement, and we changed the hearts and minds of Canadians going into the free trade agreement, not the pre-NAFTA one. Two-thirds of Canadians were for free trade. By the end of the debate in 88, uh, two-thirds were not in favor, were opposed. So we really had an intense, intense debate in this country. We put a million, uh, to comic books, we call them, on what is the free trade agreement into people's homes. I mean, we really came together as a movement, and we came together as a coalition. We used to meet in the Assembly of First Nations uh, meeting room. It was labor unions and environmentalists and women's groups and social justice groups and faith-based groups and so on, and we really put up a, a strong fight. Uh, tragically, there were three parties running. Two parties, both the Liberals and the NDP, were opposed, so the, the uh, the pro vote, uh, the anti vote was split between those two parties, and so we got uh, the Canada US Free Trade Agreement. Similarly, with NAFTA, when Chrétien came in in 93, he said, I will not sign NAFTA without six 
fundamental changes, and he didn't get them. He didn't do one of them. I mean, he lied. And I always remember he looked <laughs> kind of wouldn't look at the camera when he made the announcement that they were going to uh, be doing this. And so it's. This has been a, a long journey for us, and on the way, uh, we decided, do we, after the, put it this way, after the NAFTA laws, I thought, well, that's it, we got set up, it's like the Canada US Free Trade Agreement and NAFTA, let's just go home. I wrote to our supporters, who were mostly individuals who cared and gave us money, it wasn't a big grassroots group at the time, and I said, do you want us to fold or keep going? And they said, oh my God, keep going. This is the beginning of economic globalization, and we're going to have to fight for Medicare, and we're going to have to fight for um, the right to set our standards, the right to regulate, and so on. We could see it coming. Um, and so we decided to go grassroots, and that was a, a decision to, yes, continue to, to be together, to expand away from just uh, talking about trade uh, and build a movement. And so we, we built a movement where we see us as serving our base as opposed to the base serving uh, us, if you see what I mean. We try from our national office and from our regional offices to put material there and help people become the activists that they want to be and to serve the activist base that we have. And it, I, said, I, I think it's a model that's uh, really exciting. It means you need to be in touch with your base a lot. Um, I mean, we've laughed over the years, people writing in and saying, I think Maude should get her hair cut, or I didn't like the dress she was wearing on television, or that kind of caring, you know, for people who have opinions about absolutely everything, but you have to write them back and you have to take that kind of care, as you well know. So, uh, in, in along there, we ended up fighting trade agreements we won. I don't know if any of you remember the multilateral agreement on investment, but that was one that was international, it was through the OECD, it was for the industrialized countries and they were then gonna take it to the WTO. Um, and we launched a fierce fight and this was international and we won. We invaded the WTO ministerials. We were in the battle in Seattle, it was absolutely amazing. It was one of those things like Woodstock for a different generation. If you weren't there, you lied and said you were. Because the battle in Seattle was amazing to, to be part of, right? And, the Pentagon did a study, they got the RAND Corporation to do a study of who the hell were these people that shut down the WTO, right, in Seattle. And they came back with a, with a report that said we're like mosquitoes. They can't find their headquarters, we're really annoying, there are a lot of us and we stink. And that was actually what the RAND Corporation, how they described our movement to the Pentagon. I thought it was just a delightful description. So we went on to fight uh, groups, the agreements like the new Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement with Europe, which you guys need to know more uh, about, but we've had a lot of wins, and I guess I want to say, to, this is one of my messages to you today, is that sometimes a campaign takes a long, long, long time, and you really need to be ready to watch that come to fruition. We had a huge announcement that got absolutely no media uh, about a month ago, but the European Commission has basically said they are not going to include ISDS, the Investor State Dispute Settlement, in any future trade agreements, investment agreements that Europe signs because it was so controversial. The concern in Europe was more about the one they were planning with the US, but Trump pulled them out of that. Well, we kept saying to them, but CETA is the same because there are 42,000 American companies operating in Canada and they can just sue you through Canada. They don't have to have their own agreement with you, they can just use CETA. When the Europeans got this, my God, they were on fire. I mean, I was at marches in Berlin where we had uh, 500, 600,000 people over CETA, which most Canadians have never heard of. We really had a hard time, we're still having a hard time, I think, here because people think, oh, Europe's cool, and you know, they've got higher labor and environmental standards, so it's okay, but of course, that's not the point. The point is that what these companies want is to use these agreements to challenge these higher standards wherever they are. So one of my pleas to you as well is that we really have to, no matter what you're doing, what area you're working in, is that you need to know more about these international agreements, what they mean, how they are impacting the, the work that you do. I'm absolutely convinced, for instance, that the reason the Trudeau government is refusing to, to even consider a pharmacare pro pro program is that they know they get sued. The, the, um, there's a big report out of the government's uh, uh, own office this morning saying that we would save over $4 billion a year 
if we got a pharma care program, government won't discuss it. Now, why won't they discuss it if their own uh, advisors are telling them this is the money Canadians and you could save? And I'm convinced it's because they know that the big pharmaceutical companies in Europe under CETA and in the United States under NAFTA could sue, which they could do, for millions, potentially billions of dollars of lost profit if this doesn't take, if this doesn't take place. So we're back now to the NAFTA renegotiation, and uh, we're deeply involved, and if anybody's interested, please go to our website, canadians.org. I've just finished a report that should be up on our site in about two or three weeks, basically telling the story of where it started and what the concerns are, including the energy chapter, where we signed a proportionality agreement with the United States, which basically means that we can't cut our emissions in the, in the tar sands, we can't cut the tar sands because we are committed to a steady supply of energy to the U.S. So it's very important um, that, we, that, that we pay attention to these issues. Along the way, way back in 1985, I was reading the Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement and I came to the annex at the end that described what is a tradable good because there are all sorts of prohi prohibitions on stopping the export of any tradable good, so it's important to know what's in there. And I noted that it said water including ice and snow in all its forms. And I thought, what? how can that be that water is a tradable good? I don't understand. I knew nothing about water. I wasn't an environmentalist, hardly anybody was back in, in the 1980s. If you were into justice, you were into social justice issues. And that started me on an incredible journey because I could not figure out who was making decisions around water. I wrote the first, as, I, as far as I know, the first analysis on, called Blue Gold. Uh, the World Water Crisis and the Commodification of the World's Water for, as a report for the International Forum on Globalization. And we just got it all over the world and we started hearing back from people in communities in poor countries saying they've privatized my water, these companies have come in and taken it over. Uh, the first water war took place in uh, Cochabamba, Bolivia in 1995-96. Uh, when the World Bank said to them, if you want, if you want money for water infrastructure, you have, to, you have no choice, we're going to pick a corporation and we're going to make the agreement and that's the way it is. They picked Bechtel, which, knew, which is an engineering company, knew nothing about water. First thing Bechtel does is triple the price of water, and this is a very poor indigenous community, about 85% indigenous. They can't afford it. Then they say, and by the way, we own the rain. So if you start collecting water in cisterns, we, will, we, have, uh, we have inspectors that are going to go around to near communities and find you and fine you or put you in jail if you can't uh, pay the fine. So there was an, up, uh, an uprising and people you know, came, took to the streets, the army was called out, people were killed, the, they won. The Bechtel was forced to leave, the World Bank was forced to back down and they subsequently elected Evo Morales, the first indigenous leader there, but uh, the, the leader of the movement uh, against water privatization was uh, a shoemaker, uh, Oscar Oliveira, who'd never been outside of Cochabamba before, a marvelous, marvelous man, just with courage. We brought him to a World Bank protest a couple of years after they won that, and this is his first time ever outside of Bolivia. He didn't speak English, of course, why would he? Um, and he came to this huge church that we were speaking at. We had thousands of people at this church, and his plane was late, so we waited about 10 o'clock at night. He finally gets there. He gets up and he gives a speech that just brought the place to tears. People were standing on their chairs, cheering for him, and this was the launch of our international water movement, um, water justice movement. And it was, was a, a, one of the, the most important things that I've ever been part of. It ended, uh, not ended, it culminated, and then we had much to do since, but a very high point was in, on July 28, 2010, the UN General Assembly <coughs> agreed to adopt a resolution that water is a human right, uh, water and sanitation, and they put them both in there, and the, the, the person I was working with, because I was also advising on a voluntary basis, the 63rd President of the UN General Assembly, a marvelous man, a, a, Father Miguel Vizcardo Brockman, who was a, a, a theologian, liberation theologian from Nicaragua, who fought Reagan. Um, but it was a man named Pablo Somo, who was from Bolivia, who lived through that situation, who promised me if we ever get to the UN, if I ever get there, I'm going to work with you to, to have the water uh, 
named as a human right. Um, and so he put the he put it to the General Assembly, and people were furious. Canada was leading the fight against the human right to water, if you can believe it. The U.S. was opposed, Great Britain was opposed, all the English-speaking neoliberal countries were opposed, the World Bank was opposed, the water companies were opposed, the bottled water companies were opposed. But we got it, um, and you could hear a pin drop when, when he spoke, and, and when they vote at the UN, they do it electronically, so it immediately comes up on a great big board. And I was standing up in the balcony holding hands with my staff, thinking, we're gonna lose, they were in tears. I was hugging them, saying, it's okay, we'll, you know, we'll be back in two years or five years, whatever it takes. Not a chance, 122 countries voted in favor. Only 41 abstained, not even Canada voted against, which was a very sweet moment. And then Pablo came up and joined us in the balcony, and one after another, the ambassadors were just taking a strip off and looking up and saying, how dare you force this on us? You made us look bad, and we weren't ready, and we haven't done enough study. And at, he had started off by, when he made the proposal, saying every three and a half seconds in our world, in, in the global south, a child dies of waterborne disease, and then he put up his two fingers, three, and then half of, of the fourth. That's the moment when we won. I knew it. But anyway, there's you know our ambassador, Harper's ambassador, giving him hell, and he's standing there in front of the balcony with a big shitty and grin, as if to say, "And what part of I just won and you didn't? <laughs> Do you not get it?" It was a very very sweet David and Goliath moment, and we have had huge huge success since then in in some very important ways, um, including uh, the, uh, the First Nations people of the Kalahari Desert getting the right to water and to go back to their desert using uh, the, human, the human right uh, resolution there. So I share this with you because I want you to know that in my organization and in all of the organizations that you represent, we could not do any of this without you. The work that you do, the fundraising, the social media, the getting the work out is incredibly important. And I want to honor and thank my own development team, but to honor and thank you as well. Um, and I know that when you do your job well, it's because you've been integrated into the workings of the organization. I've seen too many organizations where the fundraising and the development is siloed off because people don't think it's important or whatever, but it is, it, it is fundamentally important that it's, this is done as a team. In fact, we had a, a protest yesterday in front of uh, the NAFTA hearings with a bunch of environmental groups and ourselves included on NAFTA and climate change because we want the commitment to the Paris Accord inside the agreement, which of course will never happen. But anyway, we, we want to put out what we need, right? Um, and there were a lot of folks from our development team there. They weren't back in the office. They were out there holding the banner, talking to the media, marching and speaking. So it's really important. Just some thoughts on, on sharing with you some advice of what I've learned over the years, not in any particular order. Uh, learn and listen to uh, the voices and work with the voices of the grassroots. Now, I know you know that technically, but it's really important that you build that into the way your operations exist. There are, there, there, in my opinion, they're way more important than politicians. The grassroots, getting to the grassroots, getting them involved is more important than convincing one politician to change his, his or her position. My image of this, and I used to be the other way. I used to go to I used to go to, to um, uh, Parliament Hill all the time. I used to go when, when Mulroney was in power, and we'd get insulted when you know when Gretchen was in power. They would be less rude, but they wouldn't listen. They stuck you know earplugs in their ears and pretend they're listening. I stopped doing that. I don't go anymore. For a whole year, I wasn't allowed up there because I got arrested at a a, pro a pipeline protest. <laughs> it was. Um, three years ago, I guess, and I, I crossed the barrier knowing I was, I was one of the first, knowing I was gonna get arrested, and this great big, huge RCMP guy said, ma'am, I'm like gonna ask you to step back over the barrier, and I said, I'm just sorry, I'm not gonna be able to do that. It's all like a morality play. They know, right? They tell you three times, if you don't go over, you're gonna get arrested. I said, I can't. He asked me a second time, then he leaned down and he said, Miss Barlow, my wife's a huge fan of yours, and if I have to go home and tell her I arrested you, I'm going to tell her a story. 
I said, I'm really sorry, would you like a note? He said, well, I'm not. <laughs> I take it you're not going back over that barrier. I said, that's right. So he put the handcuffs on. He said, does it hurt? And I said, I think it's supposed to hurt. <laughs> so I got escorted off with a paddy wagon and wasn't allowed back on Parliament Hill for a year. And I thought, if you guys think that's a punishment, I got news for you. Not for me. This is, this is no punishment for me. Uh, but I really feel so strongly that the going out as opposed to going up is, is not that inside the beltway is what they call it in the United States, that people just get fixated on what politicians think. Well, that's important, of course, and, and, and we have some very good elected officials, but give them the strength to do the right thing by making, by creating a movement is incredibly important. If you're building a coalition, <clears throat> take all the time you need to establish the principles agreed to by all. You'll be sorry if you miss this step. And this was something that was so important for us, going to the United Nations to get the human right to water and sanitation recognized. Because there were a lot of groups who said, to hell with the United Nations. It's just a, a, a tool of the corporations. And my argument is, you bet, there's a lot of corporate lobbying and power at the UN, but it's the only place we have left. Now, it's not like the World Bank. I, I'm with you on giving up on the World Bank, but the United Nations is the place where we can still contest that kind of corporate power. And there's a very, very important uh, movement right now to uh, have a, a, an international agreement signed by governments at the United Nations to hold corporations accountable for their human rights and environmental abuses. So, I mean, there is a counter movement uh, possible at the UN. So we had to go through that, and we had to work through that, and we had to hear the voices, and we could not bulldoze it. And sometimes I think, oh my God, I'm like, I'm it's, it's uh, you know, uh, ground, ground hog day. I'm just like, every, every day, you know, this is happening over and over, but take the time you need. Obviously, you have to build an inclusive and diverse movement based on the model of justice, not charity. And I, I, again, in my water work, I know there are wonderful groups that are doing things like building wells in, in poor countries and so on, but very often it's not a model of justice. It's not a model of what do the communities there want and need, how can they tell us what, what we need to be doing to help. And very often, from the Global South, our friends would say, yeah, you're welcome here, come here and all of that, but the most important thing you can do is stop the abuse of your companies in our communities. I mean, Canadian mining companies are doing terrible things in, in many countries, particularly Central and South America. And I've been to many of these communities, I've been to many of the countries, and what they say is, thank you for your solidarity, thank you for your support, it means so much, but go home and pass a law to make these companies accountable because there's nothing that we can do if your country is allowing this to happen. We have, at this point in time, to vision a moral imperative. While we want to cherish, cherish and bring the very best from the past with us, we need to speak now of a vision for the future. This current ideology, the one that I talked about that started with Mulroney and Reagan and Thatcher and just spread like wildfire, deregulation, privatization, corporate-dominated free trade, is totally failing it. And right now, pretty well everyone can see it. And this is the some of the backstory behind Trump getting into power in the United States. Not everybody who voted for Trump is a racist. There were a lot of people who lost jobs, whole, whose whole communities went when NAFTA went. And they this is the first person to come along and say, I hear your pain. Now I don't believe it for a moment, of course, but but he was the first politician in a long time. The Democrats didn't come into those communities. They took them for granted. And by the way, in our country, in the early 80s, manufacturing accounted for 26% um, uh, uh, of our GDP. If you know what it is now, it's under 11%. I mean, that, that huge rush of manufacturing away because the corporations were allowed to do so um, took place, and that's why governments are so dependent on natural resources, extra uh, extractive resources, for job creation, because we've, we're, we've allowed that secondary uh, creation to, to go. There's now what we call the precariat in the world. The United Nations says that three quarters of the world's working age population does not have a decent job with any kind of security. Three quarters, not one quarter, not a half, three quarters. Most don't have pensions, can't take vacations, don't get overtime, have no union representing them. 
They have no security whatsoever. They're, they're, they are what the United Nations calls the precariat. They promised us, and I remember this fight, I'm old enough now to remember the genesis of it. It was going, this, this way of economic globalization was going to rise all boats. Well, it didn't rise all boats. It rose the big, the big guys, the big liners, and the big, uh, steam, the big ships taking the oil and stuff, but it didn't, it didn't rise the little boats. And there's a huge vacuum right now for our boats. This is a big one for me. Assume the perspective of time and patience. Change comes in waves, and we have to learn from history. It's really important not to get bogged down thinking, oh, you know, this fight is, is, is too long. There's what I call the slow burn uh, winds or campaigns and the fast burn. Sometimes a slow burn can be terribly, terribly frustrating, and who knows what's going to happen with it. Um, by the way, just as a piece of good news, we're pretty sure the Energy East pipeline is gone. Uh, and it looks like Kinder Morgan is in very, very serious trouble. So the, the, the work that we have all done collectively on these pipelines and has taken so much energy and so much stress and so much passion, um, I do believe is going, to, is going to serve us in the end. We need to support the struggles of others walk on their picket lines, circulate their petitions, form common fronts, work closely with labor unions and the unemployed, stand in solidarity for reconciliation with First Nations. Incredibly important that we build these movements. And I do want to say that I have noted often, looking at young activists, that there's often a separation between workers, like unions, uh, and others. And I really feel we have to put that together. Sometimes it's hard um, on our board, our representatives of public sector unions and Unifor and environmentalists, and, and Unifor will represent some of the workers in the sectors that the environmentalists want gone. We have to sit down together at the table. We have to do this. We have to support our leaders and not resent them. It's hard to be the, the, the public face of the cause, but we also have to understand that every single contribution matters, and the work of others must be recognized. I have a few don'ts in my arsenal here, and this is the first one you'll find strange as a group of uh, fundraisers, but don't think that money is the answer for everything. Yes, we need resources, but often it's the human contribution that makes the difference. You don't have to raise all the money for a campaign right away, and I, again, I've watched this happen where People say, well, we don't have the money, so we can't do it. I'm not particularly religious. I like to think of myself as spiritual, but I love the story of the loaves and fishes in, in the Bible, which is that if you do the work, the, the resources will find you. I am so deeply convinced, and it's been my mantra over and over the years. Um, take the chance. Take the plunge. Don't think you have to have all the resources first. Perfect example, we took the Conservative Party of Canada to court, to the federal court, um, for the robo calls of the 2011 election. And we were deeply concerned, as were many Canadians, about the fraud that had taken place. Our lawyer said, I think it'll cost about $150,000. And we said, oh my God, where are we going to find that? You know what it cost? It cost $600,000 because the Conservative Party hired this horrible bunch of lawyers. Not all lawyers are horrible. These particular lawyers are horrible. <laughs> they served us with a 700-page affidavit. They named me as a wanton and officious intermeddler. I have a great button my, that my staff did. It's called, you know, proud, wanton, and officious uh, intermeddler. Uh, and they slapped everything at us. And we, so it was huge. We went, to the, we went to Canadians. We did it all on social media. We actually raised $600,000 because people were so furious. We spent every cent of it on this campaign, I can assure you. But if, if there was a loaves and fishes, if ever I saw one, and I'll never forget the night the ruling came down. They didn't reset the election in those six ridings that we named, but they said, there is no question that robo calls took place during the election and they were fraudulent. There is no question that they, uh, in, they impacted the outcome of the election and, this, and it is very likely that the source was the Conservative Party of Canada. That's what the federal court said. And the, and the Harper government had the nerve to say they won. I can remember going on television and saying, you know, that the universe has just been set upside down. I mean, how could you possibly consider that a win? You, you just have this fraud laid at your, at your, at your fingertips. So, 
really, I do so deeply believe that if the work you're doing is, is speaking to people, uh, the, the, the people resources or the financial resources will find you. Don't get discouraged if you don't win quickly or even ever. Many issues we deal with do not get solved in our lifetimes. Be proud of the piece you've contributed to. And remember, it's good to plant a tree under which you may not be able, uh, you may not live long enough to, to sit under the, sh uh, the shade of. Listen to the words of the African-American community leader, Mel King. I love this. He says, the dream is in the process and not the outcome. It is found in the struggle for peace and not in achieving it in the workings of the artist and not the creation, in the sun's rays and not the sun. It's in the belief that we can. He also said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. Don't get better, bitter and closed down. You will not be affected if you lose your humanity. I have seen this a lot in my lifetime too. Don't let the world or the issue take over your life Build in serious quality time with friends and family. Be kind to yourself. Take care of yourself. Be kind to others. Everyone is fighting a, a terrible battle. You are good to no one if you burn out. And this one is very important to me. Do not judge a campaign by whether you won it or not. This is setting yourself up for personal disappointment and will make you question why you became uh, committed as an activist in the first place. Just to witness is crucial. Sometimes, Merle, you know this. You've done, you've been there. You'll hold a press conference or you hold an event and nobody comes or hardly anybody comes. Nobody notices. It doesn't seem, it's as if it hadn't happened. It did happen. And even from so-called losing campaigns can come a new solidarity. I was in Chatham, Ontario last week where they're fighting um, wells that are being destroyed by an industrial wind, wind farm by Sun Samsung. I'm totally pro-wind, so please understand. But they put these on a shale shelf, and we're asking for them to stop until they can find a way to, uh, that's not destroying people's water. What was so amazing was that the people at this event were local farmers, local community people, country people, never been involved in anything like this before, so they're just having to mount a campaign with the Ontario Ministry of the Environment and so on. And the local First Nations grandmothers had come to them and said, we're here for you for the struggle. So they opened the session, and you could see for a lot of people there, it was the first time that ever this had ever happened. And one woman, the non-Indigenous woman, got up and she turned to the grandmothers, and she was in tears, and she said, I owe you an apology because I know you've been struggling with water issues in your community for years. I know. And I never reached out to you. And here we've had this, and you've not only reached out to us, you are just giving and giving and giving, and you are helping us. You're helping give the voice to this. And I apologize to you, she said. And now we're going to build a community that no matter what happens, we're together. And I thought, Sometimes, even in the face of really bad things, something very positive can, can come forward. Don't think you have to carry the burden yourself. Nobody is that important. And this is really an important one. When you lose a fight or you just can't win it, you think, well, I lost. I didn't do it well. I'm, I'm, I'm at fault. You know you're not. And I want to read the beautiful words of Vanda Mashiba. You might know her. She's a, a food justice, water justice activist from India. Somebody said there, how do you do it? She says, how do I do it? Well, it's always a mystery because you don't know why you get depleted or recharged. But this much I know. I do not allow myself to be overcome by hopelessness no matter how tough the situation. I believe if you just do your little bit without thinking of the bigness of what you stand against, if you turn to the enlargement of your own capacities, just that itself creates new potential. She says, and I've learned from the Bhagavad Gita and other teachings of our culture to detach myself from the results of what I do because those are not in my hands. The context is not in your control, but your commitment is yours to make, and you can make the deepest commitment with a total detachment about where it will take you. I find this very hard to do, but I want to share it with you because I think it's important. You want it to lead to a better world and you shape your actions and take full responsibility for them, but then you have detachment. And that combination of deep commitment and deep detachment allows me to take on the next challenge because I don't cripple myself. I function like a free being. Getting 
that freedom is a social duty we owe to one another. What we owe one another is a celebration of life and to replace fear and hopelessness with fearlessness and joy. Isn't that gorgeous? So this brings me to hope, which I'm going to end with, and the whole notion that hope is a moral imperative. I was just in a lovely community called Bayfield where they're trying to go plastic free. They're trying to start a movement around the Great Lakes to go plastics free. We were walking, and everybody's banned bottled water. The hotels there, the restaurants, nobody, no bottled water anywhere, not even in a store. There was a bottled water, plastic bottled water on the ground. They all went, oh, where did that come from? I thought, this is, this is my utopia, right? <laughs> but there was a guy there who studied with Al Gore, and he gave a slide presentation that went on and on and on, on and on and on. There were a lot of young people in the audience. He didn't get to the good part at the end. He just had one devastating slide and stat after another. We were all just like, this is kill me now, right? It was just, it was powerful, but it was, you have to have hope. And I, I watched the kids, because they were just sitting there like this, just absolutely overwhelmed. What future is there? He said, oh, I've got some stuff at hope at the end, but he was 15 minutes over by then, so he was racing through his slides to get to the hope. Look, we're living in tough times. We're living through the fallout of the Trump years, his intolerance, his division, his denial of climate change. The threats of war seem omnipresent, and he's unleashed really ugly t tendencies deep within not just American society, but we're seeing it here, that we would rather not admit exists. But this is a crucial moment for progressives, and we are needed more than ever. I just want to say that so strongly to you. Here's what I've learned about hope. It's not about winning or losing. It's about building a movement that is sustainable. It's about democracy. It's about supporting one another through hard times. It's about laughter and good food together. It's about trust and friendship. It's about protecting all that is good for future generations and the planet. It's about a commitment to a dream that's bigger than any piece of its parts. We have to learn to see victory in small things, a new friend, an emerging new network, new information we didn't have before. We have to recognize that sometimes our victories come as subtle, complex, slow changes instead of big wins that we would like, but we have to count them anyway because they matter. Having something you care about more than yourself will get you up in the morning. As a 95-year-old friend of mine said, when you think that you're just tired of fighting for social justice, well, cut it out. She says, fighting for social justice is like taking a bath. You do it every day or you stink. <laughs> Last story, and I know I have to stop. Last story. This is one that was a 25-year struggle, all right? Back to Ontario, back to lovely Georgian Bay, up if anybody here knows where Barrie is, so north of Barrie, up in a community called Simcoe County. Beautiful primate farmland. They have an aquifer there called the Alisman Aquifer right on Georgian Bay that has been tested in a lab in Germany as being the cleanest water anywhere, right? Or at least that this lab had ever tested. So what did the local community, so the local Simcoe County Council was made up of the mayors of all these small villages. One of them is actually called Tiny Township. And then they elect a warden. So that's who governs the, the Simcoe County. So 20 some years ago, the council of Simcoe County decided what to do with the purest water in Canada. Well, let's put a great big massive industrial size dump site right on it. And it was to have four huge cells lined with plastic. By the way, they're only guaranteed for two years, these cells. Um, but they weren't just going to put local garbage. They were going to sell the site to industrial garbage people, uh, corporations or industrial whatever, quarries and everything, to come there and dump their, their stuff. Right on Sim Lake Simcoe. So a fight started 22 years ago. And the community came together. It was absolutely incredible. This was a community coming together from all sectors. My organization got involved about 10 years ago. Um, and so we, we fought and fought and fought. And six years ago now, they, we um, basically, we run out of all our legal options. And the local warden was totally pro, it's called Site 41, was totally pro Site 41. So he said, we're going to get started. So he started bringing in the heavy equipment. They'd already cleared the land. They'd, they'd 
kicked the farmers off and paid them nothing for their land. And in this came the heavy equipment. So a group of First Nations women from the local Mosulay First Nation asked the farmer right across the way, could they set up a peace camp, a peace vigil? And he said, you bet, because he was opposed to it too, of course. So they set up a, a vigil. They lit a sacred fire. And they said, the fire will not be put out until we have stopped the construction of Site 41. So they would get up every morning at 5 in the morning and just happen to hold their prayer vigil in, front, uh, in the road where the big trucks had to come in, right? And they would be joined by the local community every morning at 5 o'clock prayer vigil, no matter what the, what the, now the spring by this time, it can still be quite cold. They held it up for five weeks, and by then it was too late for the cells, the first cell to be done because the frost would have come in. So the warden was furious. He started arresting people. He started arresting young First Nations mothers. It was just awful. He went to a, they, the police came to the, the farmhouse of an 82-year-old couple. She taught school for many years. She was baking butter tarts for the local um, church bazaar when they, when they arrived to arrest her because she was one of the people who'd sit in front of the, the, the trucks every day. And she taught these young police officers who came in. So she said, oh, boys, I'll go with you in a minute. But come in and have some tea and butter tarts. So in they came. And we used the occasion, the time, to phone the media. So because this had suddenly become something the national media was interested in. And so she got taken away. She wasn't handcuffed, but she was put in, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the car. She said, I've never had so much as a parking ticket, but if I'm going down, I'm going down for water, right? I thought then we're going to win. We just can't, you just cannot uh, put uh, 82 year old butter tart making, uh, church going, former teacher, farmer in a, in a, you know, you cannot arrest her and think that this is going to go, this has anywhere good to go. So we finally got the county council to agree to a, a, a vote on a moratorium. And it was held on October 25th of that, uh, sorry, August 25th of that same summer. And it was bedlam. There were maybe 2,000 people who came from all over the community. It's a little, little village where this town council meets. And so about 300 people somehow got into the balcony and the rest had to stay outside. So we set up a, a speaker's thing for them. And it was wild democracy. I mean, the people were throwing buns. And it was like the feelings were really high, right? So there were three factions on county council. There was a third of the people were against Site 41. Clearly, we knew we had their vote. A third were for Site 41, therefore against the moratorium. Against the moratorium. The middle third, we didn't know which way they were going to go. And the Golden Mail was there, and the CBC, and the CTV, and the John the Star, blah, blah, blah. It was high drama, right? So our proponent, uh, the mayor of uh, Tiny Township, got up. She gave a great speech, lots of clapping for her. Then the guy who was going to represent the other side got up to speak. Now he was the mayor of another small township, huge guy, former businessman, very rich, used to be a linebacker for this football team, tough guy, fought site 40 for site 41, fought the protesters for years. He was a real tough guy. Gets up to speak, starts to cry. And this is a true story. And he said, and you can hear a pin drop, and I mean including outside, like people are, oh, I'm not even going to breathe here. He said, when I got up this morning, I was going to come in here and I was going to fight you guys, he goes like this to the balcony, I was, going to, I was going to stop this moratorium, and I was going to push for Site 41, and then I went into my home office and my grandchildren had found, taken one of the site, stop Site 41 signs that were all over the county, put it on his desk and then wrote the word Papa on it meaning we stop it, Papa. And that man said, and this is the truth, at that moment, my job description changed, and I became a steward of the water of Simcoe County, and as long as I live, I will never, ever allow Site 41 to be built. Unanimously, we got our moratorium. We didn't need it. They pulled the request from the ministry. Uh, the farmland is now back, the farm area is back in full. Or in production, Site 41, uh, the fight was won after 20, something like 23, 24 years. I end with this story because I, I want you to feel that what you're doing matters, and it doesn't always seem obvious when you're in a struggle, but it's always worth it. And hence the title of my talk is that it's always too soon to give up. It's always too soon to go home. 
I have seen too many struggles stop just as they're up at that hill and that boulder's getting really, really heavy and they're throwing stones at you from the top. And the reason they're throwing stones is, is you're almost there. You don't give up. What you stand for, what you're fighting for matters. It matters to you, it matters to me, it matters to the world, it matters to the generations to come. And I thank you for your work, and I thank you for the day. Okay, well, thank you very much, Maud Barlow. Just a quick, uh, how, I guess, housekeeping. Um, break is down in the basement. You have the first session starts at 10.30. There's a couple uh, interesting things, obviously, going on down in the break room. If you haven't seen any of the information, CARE 2, one of our wonderful sponsors, is collecting items for the Downtown Eastside Women's Center. So if you have brought anything, um, please leave them downstairs by 1 p.m. Um, also, you'll see there's a, a fascinating, which I'm quite eager to take part, Canada Post has set up a wonderful photo booth. Um, so please interact with that. That's all downstairs. And um, there's elevators over there and stairs to get to the different sessions are located on a few different floors. But yeah, have a great break, and first session started at 10.30. Thank you very much.